Hello, everybody, and welcome to Walking Between Shadows. I'm Taryn Elliott, and along with me is my amazing husband. I'm Ben Elliott. And we're here to talk about true crime all the time. Hey, everybody, I'm Taryn Elliott. This is Walking Between Shadows, and yes, I am in my bed. Don't judge me. And I am doing another episode. And y'all, today I'm going to talk about one of the most fucked up cases that I have ever researched, heard about, didn't, didn't hear about, and grew up in Tennessee and was an adult during the time of this crime and never heard of this. Um, there was a lot of there was a lot of cover up in in this case because of um, media was kind of not allowed in in into the courtrooms and they tried to keep this under wraps as much as they could. But I'm going to talk to y'all about it today. Like I said, somebody had requested me to do this case in my emails. I've had two requests for this case, and um, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. It was pointless. It w There's really nothing to learn of it. There was a couple laws that came from this case, but none that, that, I mean, there was no justification. There was no, like, there really isn't with any murder. Eh, I take that back. But this one is so senseless and so torturous and horrifying. So let's talk about it. On January the 6th of 2007, Shannon Christian and her boyfriend Christopher Newsom were getting ready for a night out on the town in Knoxville, Tennessee. And this is where they both grew up and were from. Um, Shannon was a 21-year-old student at the University of Tennessee, and she also worked two jobs. Chris was a 23-year-old trim carpenter for a construction company in Knoxville. And the two of them had been dating for about three months. Um, earlier that day, on the 6th of January, Shannon decided to go to a friend's apartment at Washington Ridge Apartments in Knoxville and get ready for the night ahead with Chris. So Shannon goes to the apartment. She gets ready, and she's waiting on Chris, and he's running a little late. So she decides to go downstairs to her forerunner and wait for him in the parking lot. Around 9 p.m., Chris pulls into the parking lot at the Washington Ridge Apartments and parks his truck and continues to walk over to uh, Shannon's forerunner. And so they meet up in the parking lot and I guess they decided to have a little embrace and a little smooch and they were distracted. And little did they know there was four men that were watching them at that time. LaMarcus Davidson was a local drug dealer and well-known thief and also the apparent ringleader of this of this group that he enlisted his brother Latalvis Cobbins, his two friends Eric Boyd and um, George Thomas in a carjacking, and they thought this was going to be a normal carjacking. So they're down, you know. Let's do this. It's after Christmas. We're going to get a new car. We need some money. So they're watching as. Chris and Shannon are embracing in the parking lot and sharing that little smooch when they first met up. They forced the two in the back at gunpoint um, of Shannon's fore forerunner, and they tie their arms behind their backs. They kind of piled them on top of one another in the back seat of her forerunner, and they drive to LaMarcus Davidson's rental home on Shipman Street. I'm not sure, and no one is sure why they picked this couple. They did not know Chris and Shannon. Um, they had no ties to them, but they, I guess it was just one of those moments where they, the, the couple was distracted and they jumped. So the four take them to LaMarcus Davidson's rental home on Chipman Street. And once they get there, it really, really, really gets bad. They meet up with Vanessa Coleman, who is already at the Chipman Street house, and 
they divide, they separate the two, the Chris and Shannon. And it's believed and not fully clear about the timeline, but that Chris is the first one who is tortured by this, this group of people. And Chris is taken into another room, tied up, and he is beat, and he is raped, at least by one man, and uh, one of the four men he is raped, and he is um, also raped with a foreign object, and they believe that was a broken chair leg. Um, after about four hours of this, they force Chris to walk to a secluded area with them, and they have him his arms tied behind his back, and they have him blindfolded with a do-rag, and they have his sock in his mouth. They also have a leash tied around Chris's neck so that he cannot run away from them. Once they get to a railroad track, made to kneel on the railroad tracks and a belt is tied around his ankles to secure them tight and a sweatshirt, I believe it's his, is pulled over his head. Now it's the dead of winter, January, and he is only wearing a t-shirt and his underwear. After being completely tortured and raped and just I can't even imagine. So once they have him kneeled onto the railroad tracks with the sweatshirt over his head and he is he is tied up, they shoot him in the back of the neck and it travels between the neck, the bullet travels between the neck and, the sh and his shoulder and he falls forward onto the railroad tracks. At that time, they shoot him once again in the back and the bullet travels up to the torso, but he is still alive. And eventually, they put the gun above his right ear, and they shoot him in the head, and that kills him instantly. After that, they wrap him in a blanket, I believe a comforter, from the Chipman Street rental home, and they douse it down with gasoline, and they catch it on fire. So Chris's ordeal went on for about four hours. They believe the gunshots went off around 1.45 a.m. on Sunday morning. And Shannon's torture is going to last much longer. And it's, mm -hmm. y'all, this one is really hard. This one has given me nightmares. So they get back to the Chipman Street home. This, the, and they're, they're not clear who all went to take care of Chris, but they do know that uh, Vanessa Coleman was at home and she did not allow um, Shannon to escape. So when they get back to to the Chipman Street home, the men take turns raping and beating mm -hmm. and stabbing Shannon. Once I know in the side of the head, they raped her with foreign objects in her rectum and her vagina. And um, y'all, I, I mean, the things she was covered in, in a carpet, carpet burns and bruises, and there was hemorrhaging in her genital area from, from the forced objects and the foreign objects and the rapes and the sodomy and um, laceration to her, the side of her head where she was stabbed by these people or these animals. When these fucking predators decided they were tired of torturing Shannon. I believe they went a step beyond evil and they did something so fucked up. They, they were all high on PCP, which doesn't excuse any fucking thing they did, but they were. And they, but they were, they thought enough to think we need to get rid of this DNA. So they doused her down with bleach and scrubbed her affected areas. Um, then they poured bleach into Shannon's mouth to try to rid of their fucking DNA. 
she was still alive. Shannon, they had ripped her teeth from her gums by forcing objects into her mouth. Um, then they put a bat, they did, they, they decided to tie her up very tightly in the fetal position. And it was such a tight position that Shannon's cheek was laying on her knee. So they wound her in fabric and materials that they had from the, the Ch Chipman Street home. And then they put a plastic bag over her head a small, you know, like the little Walmart bags over her head and tied it tightly around her neck. They placed her in five bags, garbage bags, the black bags. And then they put her in a 32 gallon plastic garbage bag, put some more of the, the bloody material that they had beat her and raped her on, on top of her. And they closed the lid to this trash can and Vanessa Coleman cooked breakfast for these people. That morning, with Shannon slowly suffocating in this trash can, y'all, I can't, I can't imagine. She was still alive, and when they they know that Shannon ended up dying from positional asphyxiation and confined space asphyxiation, y'all, I can't even imagine. I've seen some pictures of like Chinese tortures where they put them in these positions that they can't get out of, and it kills you eventually. And that's what's ha that that is what happened to Shannon. Um, when Shannon was found, like I said, her eyes were wide open. Shannon was believed not to die until late Sunday night or early Monday morning. Um, they also forced Shannon to call her father um, uh, late Sunday night and tell him that she was going to be late. So they did make her do that. Chris's body was found by a railroad worker um, around 11 hours mm -hmm. after he died. Um, Semen was found in Chris's rectum, but uh, the fire, the heat from the fire destroyed the DNA for that. Um, Shannon's car was found on Monday. Fingerprints were lifted from Shannon's vehicle and led them to LaMarcus Davidson's rental home. On January the 9th, that was Tuesday, um, a warrant was obtained and they went into the Chipman Street home. There, when they got into the house, they noticed that it was empty. No one was there, but it looked like someone was in the garbage can in the kitchen. So they pulled their guns and they opened the lid slowly. And when they did, they saw a cold, dead arm coming out of trash bags and covered with a little of the material that was put on top of Shannon. They knew then that this was Shannon. In the refrigerator again with a gas can beside it. <coughs> and there's the bottle bleach cleaner and the red solution. And the garbage bag and the garbage can. There's the belt and the white glove, and there's a garbage can. And there's her arm. That's how it was when we found it. Now we're going back out to the utility room. Two garbage bags again. So they had already found Chris, and so they they knew. Um, Y'all, this is awful. There was semen found in Shannon's mouth, in her rectum. Um, 
and her vagina. And the DNA that matched what they found in Shannon was Lamarcus Davidson and Latavis Cobbins. So the two brothers. Um, there was a short manhunt for uh, Lamarcus Davidson. He was hiding out in an abandoned home. And um, Eric Boyd was eventually arrested and he led them to where Davidson was hiding in this home. During question, Lamarcus Davidson, being the piece of fucking shit that he is, he um, tried to pass the blame on Eric Boyd and George Thomas and Latavis Cobbins. Soon after, Thomas uh, Cobbins and Vanessa Coleman were all arrested and they were taken into custody. Ultimately, Lamarcus Davidson was given a death sentence. He appealed in 2019, but it was denied. Latavis Cobbins was given a life sentence without parole. George Thomas, a 127 year sentence, but agreed to testify against Eric Boyd in 2018, and that reduced um, George Thomas's sentence from 127 years to 50 years. There wasn't enough evidence to charge Eric Boyd in the first trial, so he was sentenced to 18 years the very first time in prison. But after George Thomas testified against him, they changed his sentence to life in prison. Um, there, I believe they did that because there was found to be some gay porn on um, Eric Boyd's um, phone, I believe, at the time. And I believe George Thomas testified that Eric Boyd was the one who raped um, Chris Newsom. So that's, that's where I believe that came in play. Uh, there was also insufficient evidence against Vanessa Coleman. Although she was present at the house while everything went down, and she also admitted that she was alone with Shannon and did not try to help her escape the situation, um, she was sentenced to 53 years, but it was appealed and reduced to 35 years. Since then, uh, Vanessa Coleman has been up for two paroles, parole hearings, and both times she has been denied. Uh, I do know that Shannon Christian's parents, especially her father, have been very, well, both families have been present through all these parole hearings and are making sure that they do not get out. And they don't, none of them need to get out. I'm sorry, y'all. There is nothing in this world that is pointless and senseless as this right here. I mean, this is horrifying. And I believe these motherfuckers need to stay there. I don't even believe they deserve to live in prison. But, you know, firing squad, bring it back. And they are in some states. So this is Tennessee, and they're going to live their life off appeals, of just like Krista Pike and the rest of the son of a bitches that get to go get away with doing this to innocent people. And the families of these innocent victims have to live the rest of their lives hearing about shit like this and, and knowing that these people in prison at least get the opportunity to sit down and read a book or to conversate with others, or to see their families and during visitation. It is something that these victims will never get with their families again. So thank y'all for watching, and I will see y'all next time. This has been Walking Between Shadows. Again, I'm your host, Ben Elliott, and my wife, Taryn Elliott. Look for our next episodes coming soon, and don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button.